Children of God, welcome to this brand new sermon series that we are starting today. Um, right over the next four weeks, as I've already kind of alluded to, we're going to be looking at the different baggage that we sometimes carry with us, and Jesus is going to invite us to bring it to him, lay it at his feet, unpack it in front of him, and he, and he promises to replace it with peace, joy, love, forgiveness, hope, confidence, and I could keep going on and on and on. And, and today, the first piece of baggage that we want to tackle is sometimes that baggage of inadequacy. All right, sometimes we feel inadequate. Maybe sometimes we feel like we're not worthy enough. We don't measure up enough. Maybe we even feel sometimes worthless. Well, the section of God's word that we want to look at this morning to combat that piece of baggage, it's not big. It's not a long section. It's just two verses, but they pack a very powerful punch for us today. Listen as John writes to us. He says this. See, what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. This is God's word. One of the things that my wife and I learned when we were taking some classes to be prospective foster parents is that every kid that comes into the foster care system comes with some kind of baggage. Right? And of course, I'm not just talking about the kind of baggage that you see here before you, baggage that you pack to go on vacation or on a deployment. Yet they come with that kind of baggage too. Every time a child is dropped off in that system to a foster home, they come with baggage like this. Some of them maybe bring a suitcase that's easy to drag with them and rolls nice. And they show up at that house and they meet their foster parents for the first time. Sometimes kids just show up with a duffel bag. And half the time it's the social worker that's carrying it because those kids are pretty young and, and they can't carry a bag this size. But they come with this. Some of them just come with a backpack. Maybe if they're old enough, six, seven, eight years old, they're wearing it. If not, the social worker hands it over to those foster parents. But, but they got at least some form of baggage with them. But do you know what we learned in class? That the number one baggage of choice oftentimes for a lot of these kids is just simply this. A garbage bag. And you know what they have in all these different bags? They have a few articles of their belongings. Maybe a few changes of clothes and that's it. Maybe a, a stuffed animal maybe a blankie, sometimes maybe even a picture of a of, of family or a, a loved pet. But most of the time, whatever choice of bag they have, it's, it's relatively empty because these kids come with very little. However, they all come with another piece of baggage with them. One that no one can see, one, one that no one can carry for them, they come with baggage because they're all coming from some traumatic experience, neglect or abuse, drug issues, you name it. They're coming into a home because their home environment wasn't safe. And, and so they lug bags and luggage of hurts, baggages of pain and sadness, feelings of, of maybe being unloved, or helpless to change the difficult and sad and scary situation that they are in. See, one of the things we learned in that class is that all of these kids at some level are dragging some kind of baggage with them each and every day of their lives. As I was thinking about that this past week and as I thought about this message, in some ways, 
you and I are no different. Whether you had a really great childhood or you had a difficult one, whether your life is going really well right now or not, everyone at some point is carrying around some baggage. Some of it's big, some of it's stuffed full of stuff and, and you, you can barely drag it with you. Other times, maybe it's a backpack, maybe it's even just a garbage bag with a little bit in it, but we all carry some baggage. And so in this new sermon series, we want to unpack the different baggage that we all at times struggle with. Because whether you realize it or not, people are carrying the baggage with them. They're carrying it to work with them. They're carrying it into the classroom with them. They're carrying it into their relationships and into their marriages and into, yes, even church on a Sunday morning. And many people, they have no idea what to do with it. And so they just keep dragging it with them day after day after day after day. And so we want to look to God's word to address whatever the baggage it is that we're struggling with. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. He says, give me the baggage so that you can go free. And today we're going to talk about the topic of inadequacy. A bag that maybe for some of you it's, it's, it's really, really big and it's heavy. For others, maybe not so much. But whether you struggle with it specifically or not, there are people who do. And you can be a help to them. Now, I'm guessing for a lot of you, maybe the first time you felt it was here. You felt it when you had two captains on the schoolyard and you had everybody standing right there in front of those captains. And you know what they were doing? They were picking teams. And one captain goes first, I want you, and then the next one, I want you, and I want you, and I want you, and you come down to the last two. And maybe you were part of that last two and you're thinking, please, God, don't let me be last. I mean, playground etiquette says I can't be the last one chosen and they call out the other person's name. <laughs> and you know as you walk to that team that, that you're on by default. They didn't even want you, and they let you know that they're, all right, fine, come on. Put, put them out in left field. Put them out in right field. Put them in somewhere where, you know what, just don't screw up. And at that moment, maybe that was when you fir first felt inadequate. You weren't good enough. Maybe for some of you, it's when you didn't make the team. You worked really hard. That was your sport. And, and you went out and, and you put all of your effort, 110% in, and they told you you didn't make it. And you were crushed, right? Because what, what were they saying? Not trying to in a mean way, but you weren't good enough to make the team. Better luck next year. Maybe it was when you got dumped. Right? You weren't pretty enough, you weren't smart enough, you weren't charming enough, and you got dumped, and they went after somebody who was better looking, smarter, funnier, whatever it is, and you felt that sting of rejection and being inadequate. Not good enough. For some of you, maybe it happens at the workplace. You throw in all your effort, you're trying your best, but you keep getting overlooked for the promotion. They keep telling you, you're not getting your bonus this year. And you're like, what? All I do is do everything for the company, and, and they're sending me a message, right, that, that I'm not good enough. Some of you maybe... <laughs> It was from your youth that you still think about it. it. It was parents who, you know, you'd get a B plus and instead of good job, it was why didn't you get an A? Or, or, or you worked really hard to do the chores and, and the first thing out of that parent's mouth is criticism and, and, well, you missed a spot here instead of recognizing everything else that you did. And the only thing you kept hearing from mom or dad was, you're not good enough. That's not good enough. You need to do better. Maybe it's a spouse that you feel like you just can't measure up for and do enough good. Whatever it is, though, 
I think that we all know the sting of feeling inadequate. Of feeling like we don't measure up, that we're not good enough for this, we're not good enough for the team, we're not good enough for him or her, we're not good enough for our boss. Maybe even sometimes we feel like we're not good enough for God. And you know what people often do with with this emotional baggage? They hide it. They find a deep, dark corner in their closets, the closets of their heart, and they try to shove it in there, close the door, and don't let anybody know what we're struggling with. Because that could be disastrous, right? And most people, what do we do? We build walls. We say we're fine when we're not. We paint smiles on our faces and act like everything's okay, even if our world is crashing down around us. And isn't that why when we hear things like this, we're we're so shocked, right? Like, I can't believe they're getting a divorce. They, They look so happy. They look like such a great family. Why are we shocked? Because the baggage was hidden. Or maybe we find out about that teen, whether it's our teen or a teen we know and love, like they've been depressed, they've been cutting themselves, they've been hurting themselves because they're struggling. They look like they were doing great. They got straight A's, they made the team, they got a lot of friends. I don't get it. It's because the baggage was hidden. And we don't just do that in our daily lives. We do that even here amongst each other. Right? The one place that if, it, if we would be comfortable enough to open up, it should be here at church to get open and honest and real with the baggage that we all face. What do most of us do? We hide it. Having problems with your kids? Don't tell anybody. Right? You don't want them to think less of you as a parent or, or, or as your family. Like You can't handle it, so don't say anything. Marriage is strained. Maybe you got a fight on the way to church even today. Well, don't tell anybody because we, we, we don't want them to think less of us. We don't want them to know the trouble that we're in right now. Struggle with worry or depression? Let's not talk about it. Just smile. Say I'm fine when you're asked and, and go through the doors and sit down. Struggling with some sort of addiction? Maybe it's drugs or alcohol or, or something like that. Maybe it's the addiction of pride and anger and you're super critical. Well, you know, just smile, pop a breath mint, take another antidepressant, and don't let anybody know that you're struggling with those issues. Because what will they think? You're sad? Maybe struggling with a porn addiction, some sexual sin, same-sex attraction. Don't tell the church. They're just going to judge you. So you better keep it to yourself, right? Or maybe you're struggling with your own faith. Maybe you're struggling with God and you're doubting his love and you're wondering, you know, does it even matter? Why should I even come? Is the words true? Is what that pastor says even worth listening to? Maybe you're struggling with that. Oh, really, don't tell anybody, right? What are the church folk going to think if you tell them you're actually doubting him? I think most of us, and I know this by experience because I do it all the time, we take our baggage and we hide it from everyone. But you know what? You might think that's a good approach, but that's the worst thing that you could do. You want to know why? Not only will you not get better in dealing with it, you know who wants you to take the baggage and bury it deep inside your own heart and mind and don't let anybody in? The devil. Because you know when the devil does his best work? When you are isolated and alone. When you are in your own little world, living on your own little island, that's when he does his best work, attacking, and he'll continue to separate you. And he'll continue to speak lies into your ears and into your hearts and into your minds. And so what are we going to do about this? A problem that we all wrestle with. This brings us to our our first main takeaway today. Don't hide it. 
In fact, you can't hide it. Don't hide it. Don't justify it. Don't rationalize it, right? Because if you're living some sort of sin, come clean to God. Don't try to bury it. Don't try to put it in a closet locked away. Talk about it. Don't hide it. Now, I don't necessarily mean that every Sunday you've got to come in and stand up in front of church and, and let it all air out, but find somebody that you can trust. Find somebody that you can unpack this baggage and they can unpack theirs and you're going to give them grace and they're going to give you grace and you're going to give them forgiveness and they're going to give you forgiveness in the name of Jesus. Because if we start to do that, then we become the kind of church that Jesus is head of. A church where lost, hurting, suffering sinners can find peace and joy and hope and forgiveness and freedom in him alone. Because here's the deal. If your value... If your worth is dependent on what you think of yourself, if it's dependent on what others may think or say about you, if it's dependent on how many likes you get on your Instagram feed, if it's dependent on anything but Jesus, you know what you're going to keep doing for the rest of your life? You're going to keep dragging this with you everywhere you go. So come clean to him. Go to Jesus and listen, not to what you might think, not to what others say, but what Jesus says about you. And you know what he says about you? He says this. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Do you fully grasp what Jesus is speaking into your hearts today? He's saying, you might feel inadequate at some times, and we all do. Others might say that about you. They might feel that about you, but not God. You know what God thinks? He thinks the world of you. He thinks you're precious. He loves you. In fact, he loves you so much that he calls you his child. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Right? God the Father says about you the same thing he says about his own son, Jesus. Did you know that? On the day that Jesus walked out of the Jordan River after his baptism, do you know the story? The Father spoke. And everybody there that day, and all of us, if we've heard this scripture, and you're going to hear it now, God the Father speaks to them and to us, and he says this, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. The Father speaks words of affirmation over his son. He loves him, and he's pleased with him. Not disappointed, not let down, not, can you do a little bit better? You're not measuring up. Nope, I love him and I'm well pleased, completely pleased. Now, why is the father so pleased and love his son? Because Jesus was perfect in every way. Right? Jesus never disobeyed his dad's orders. Whatever the Father said, Jesus says, your will be done, Dad, let's do it. Never once did he say, no, I'm going to do what I want. Never. Jesus never gave in to selfishness or self-centeredness. He never did anything for his own gain. It was always for the gain of you and me. Jesus never gave in to greed or pride or lust. He, he never gave in to his anger and wanted to get people back when they hurt him. No, instead he wanted to forgive them even when they nailed him to a cross. You see, unlike us, the Father's Son, Jesus, was perfect in every way. Because here is one way that you and I were inadequate. 
Here is one instance when you and I could never measure up, no matter how hard we tried, we could not do it. We're sinners. And the Apostle Paul, in the book of Romans, tells us that all of us have sinned, all of us fall short of the glory of God, all of us have together become I know this is going to hurt, this is a harsh word, but he says worthless, but not Jesus. Not Jesus, not even close, and he did it all to take away the stain of sin, to remove the label of worthless and inadequate in the Father's sight. He did it all to make you children of God. Do you see it? Right? This, this brings us to our last takeaway for today. If you're doubting, if you're struggling with feelings of inadequacy, like you don't measure up, what are you going to do? Well, stop looking at yourself and look and listen to Jesus. Right? The next time you find yourself doubting that truth, the next time you find yourself giving in to the devil's lies and you feel like you're worthless, listen to the one who loves you. Listen to the one who is willing to take up all of your baggage and all of your sins and drag them with him up on a cross and nail them there to forgive them and remove them forever. Listen to the one who in your baptism washed you of sin, took away your guilt, and adopted you and placed you into the Father's arms and said, Dad, here is your child. You're forgiven, you're loved, you're saved child. And then listen as you hear the Father hold you to himself and lavish his love upon you. Friends, I think at different times in our lives, we all carry that kind of baggage, feelings of inadequacy, feelings like we can't measure up, maybe even feelings of, of worthlessness. But that is so not true. Today, your God tells you that is not true. And so what I want you to do today, maybe this will help you, maybe it won't, but I want you to remember something. It's a phrase that I learned maybe three, four years ago. Uh, in this coaching group, a bunch of pastors, a bunch of guys who get open and honest, confess sins, share Jesus with each other, unpack the baggage. And, and there's a phrase that they keep saying over and over that I've memorized, and I've, I've, I've tried to use it with my kids and my wife and, and my own self to remind myself, and it's this. Audience of one. Audience of one. You know what that means? It means whatever you do, each and every day, First and foremost, you are living for an audience of one, your king, your God, your savior. And you know what this can help you? I hope it will help you remember that whatever you think about yourself on any given day, whether it's a good thought or a negative one, whatever others might say about you, and sometimes it won't always be good because not everybody loves you, remember this truth that God does. And that it doesn't matter what other people think or say. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself, right? The Apostle Paul once said, you think I'm working for the approval of people? I'm not. I don't care what others think or say about me. I don't even care what I think about myself. The only thing that matters is what he thinks and what he says. And the same is true for you. And you know what your God thinks about you? You know what he says about you? Do you see it? Can you hear it? He says, see, what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And because of Jesus Christ, that is what you are. Amen.